Welcome to the Autism and Neurodiversity Podcast. We're here to bring you helpful information from leading experts and give you effective tools and support. I'm Jason Grigla, a licensed counselor and founder of Techie for Life, a specialized mentoring program for neurodiverse young adults. And I'm Debbie Grigla, a certified life coach. And maybe most importantly, we're also parents to our own atypical young adults. Hello and welcome to the Autism and Neurodiversity Podcast. I'm Jason, and I'm going to continue my discussion about depression and now into suicide today. So I want to do a couple of disclaimers up front. One, I've never been suicidal, but I have felt like that I would rather be dead than alive at times in my life. And those are two different things. Uh, Two, as a therapist of over 20 years, I've never lost a client to suicide. And I don't know exactly um, what that would feel like as a therapist, but I, I expect that most people in the mental health world um, will deal with a suicide in their careers. I think I've been extremely lucky, not necessarily that I'm really good at what I do. And that's made the difference because I don't think therapists can always make or break their clients' lives. We're not that influential. We don't have that much power. Three, I have seen a lot of clients who are dealing with the aftermath of suicide. So I've had way more exposure to the effects and the ripples for the survivors of suicide. And my heart goes out to you if you've been in that situation. And that is a really hard thing. We're not going to talk about that much today. But I want you to know that I'm sorry that you're dealing with that or have had, had to deal with that. Um, four, I, I think that everything I say today is to give my experience, not to give professional advice, because suicide is serious. And anytime suicide or the thought of taking someone's life comes up, it's important to take it serious. I always want to save someone's life no matter what, and I'd rather do overkill than not take it to not not take it. What's the word? I'd rather take it serious than not take it serious, I guess is the right way to say it. At the same time, the majority of suicide programs that I've heard and attended and trained, they're very much about the message of take suicide serious and get help. And the, the, the third piece to that in the last five years is assume someone is possibly suicidal to start and search, look, explore, uh, be curious, and don't let them cop out if if they're actually severely depressed and you get a gut hunch that they could be feeling suicidal, then the programs are teaching, find out if they're really struggling and then get help, take it serious. And that will save a lot of lives. And I think those are accurate. The issue that I have, and that I want to explore more today, especially with anyone who is neurodivergent or has a loved one who is neurodivergent, is that once you realize that suicide is serious and that they are having suicidal thoughts or they are saying things that sound suicidal, there's not a lot out there about exactly what to do and to navigate the murky, to navigate the actual details of what to do next. It's really become cliche that I, and I spoke about this in my last podcast about depression, to just say, oh, they need counseling, they need counseling. And I, I think that's so oversimplified. Counseling is there not to fix the problems, but to help figure out how to fix the problems and to help family members figure out how to fix the problems. So I think counseling can be helpful, but it's also a very oversimplified resource. Second, I think the other the other overly used or cliche is they need to go to the hospital. And I'll just address that right now. Mental hospitals can be the worst. They are 
a gathering place of the most unhealthy, unstable, issuey places. And they're often full of people who have been severely mentally ill, disabled, struggling for years and years. And you get someone who has a single incident in their life that they're suicidal and they go into a mental hospital and often they are exposed to a whole world that often for those who are neurodivergent and autistic rubs off on them and our loved ones can absorb negative behaviors unhealthy attitudes unhealthy beliefs and oftentimes i find that it can be worse going in there than it would be if a family member could just stay with them 24 7 and be observed just to make sure that they don't take their life until they get through the crises which is usually a day or two or three if it's um, a first experience with suicide at the same time if you're not going to take them to a hospital it's really important to get professional observation, professional insight. So counseling, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, um, just be aware that if you take them to a mental hospital, I would keep it as short as possible before getting them into a treatment center, if that's going to be the case. If you're not going to get them into a treatment center, the next step is to bring them back home, which means you're not getting a lot of insight at the hospital. What the hospital is good for is looking at medications and having an evaluation. But for the most part, emergency inpatient treatment is meant to just keep them alive. And so you'll want to make sure that they don't just keep them alive, but they also do uh, medication if necessary. And I, I think once you get to suicidal ideations and actual, I am going to try to kill myself, that medication be used at all costs, it's fine. The, the side effects, the possible downsides of medication at that point are so small that, that I would look at medication immediately. And then maybe it's to give the family a break if they need to go into a mental hospital or a psychiatric hospital for observation to keep them alive. Maybe it's to, to keep the family sane, to give the family a break, and that's fine too. So do what you need to do. Just be aware that if they end up going into mental hospitals, oftentimes they have a lot of negatives that they come out with and they're exposed to a lot of negatives. And I, I hate that to keep someone alive, we kind of expose them to more junk. So be aware of that. Um, I don't love psychiatric hospitals. If I can avoid one, I will. But for my own kids, I would do everything I could not to go. But it's easy for me to say as a therapist because I can watch and I know I know what's going on better and I'm more comfortable with that. So take that into consideration. A couple of other cliches about suicide generally, and there's been a lot of long-term passed on bad advice. For example, the signs of suicide are um, are pretty good. People who withdraw, people who are depressed, despondent. I've never actually heard or seen anyone ever give away their belongings. Uh, maybe that's happened to you. If it has, fine. I, I'm not <laughs> saying that doesn't happen. I'm just saying that we, we like to pick up bullet points and pass them along, and then we overgeneralize. So that's something I've never heard of. The other thing that I've heard is that suicide is always, suicide is always a sickness, and I. I think that's a little inaccurate as well. Suicide is a choice and it's also a sickness for many, but it kind of it kind of falls into two categories of suicide. For those who commit suicide, many of them are long-term mentally ill and suicide had become a large part of their thinking and their existence. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But for the second group, Sometimes it can be a very quick, impulsive crisis where they um, got caught up in a really negative situation. A loved one breaks up with them, another loved one dies. They get a diagnosis that they can't handle. 
um, a single semester in school that just kicks their butt and makes them feel so crappy about themselves in life um, that it's not mental illness as much as it is a really bad crisis and they end up being impulsive and taking their life that way. And I don't even know that those people are depressed. Many of them are completely overwhelmed with anxiety. And as we've discussed before, anxiety and depression are closely related. Anxiety is the fight part where I'm going to do something about it and I'm really worked up and afraid. Depression is when they crash and they don't have much in them left to fight anymore and they slide into depression from the anxiety. Suicide can happen can happen in either in either place, the highly stressed, anxious place or the highly despairing, depressed place. So I, I think those are a little bit different. Um, the medications would be the same. The, the interventions would be the same as far as counseling. Don't letting them be alone. Not letting them be alone, excuse me. And so anyway, having it always be mental health doesn't do anyone any help. It doesn't help anyone to say it's always um, mental health related because sometimes it's impulsive and sometimes there's a lot of drugs involved that skew people's thinking so that they end up committing suicide, not an overdose. People die of overdoses all the time by accident, but people who commit suicide, oftentimes they have messed up their brain for that period of hours and even a day or two or a week with so many chemicals with alcohol or drugs of any kind that they aren't thinking clearly and they end up impulsively taking their life and I don't think that's mental health I think that's just a really crappy mix of things that happened so um, I think I think I'm struggling with personally the idea that that a suicide is that always a victim of life because it doesn't give anybody ownership and I think those who are left behind to pick up the pieces of a suicide I I don't know in some ways it doesn't seem fair if somebody if somebody killed themselves it's horrible and it's tragic and it's sad and I actually think and I've seen the research that shows that many people who almost killed themselves very shortly thereafter were glad that they didn't and so when someone doesn't go through with it they're grateful it's those who keep trying and keep trying and keep trying that have this up and down pendulum between i'm glad i didn't kill myself and then i don't have any other way out and i can't stop and i can't stop thinking about suicide they're the ones that need hospitalization long-term treatment um I guess anyone can if they need to get out of the hole that they're in. I do think depression is the most common way that people commit suicide. And I think most people left signs. And after the fact, we saw and we can see that there, there was definitely a, a risk of suicide. And so intervening is really important. Having people around us that care about us and love us enough to intervene and to pry when we think someone might be suicidal is really important. So let me get into now, specifically with neurodevelopmental disabilities and suicide. One, there's very little research. There's one big study done out of Denmark that says anyone who is autistic or diagnosed with autism as an adult is more likely to kill themselves than someone who has a, a typical brain but it also had a really weird caveat they couldn't have for that number and it was almost six times more likely to commit suicide for autists um, but it had a caveat of if they didn't have a learning disability so well, that's weird i don't understand what that is all about and also the, the country of Denmark has about 5 million people. It's very small and they have the most, I, I've lived there, I know the people, they have a social system and a mental health system like, like nowhere else. Um, everyone has access to everything. They're not poor, they're not broke. They can go to, they can go to college, they can go to school. Um, they have 
free therapy, three, free medications. So it's weird that that would be the case. And I don't think that that study applies to the rest of the world very well at all. Um, but a lot of people are jumping on it saying that because, because of that study, they can now point to the fact that autists are way more likely to commit suicide. And I, I have not experienced that. Um, it, it could be true that there's a higher rate. We also know that the lifespan of those who are diagnosed with autism is really low compared to the general population. So I just want to dive in a little bit to, to neurodivergent people and suicide. One, one I'm going to share now is largely my experience and so not science or fact or research because there's very little science and research out there. So what I've seen is that those who are neurodivergent and typically those who are behind socially and developmentally by several years are way more likely to say they're going to kill themselves than the typical population. They're way more likely to verbally say, I'm going to kill myself. And I hear it a lot because they're just stuck and they're not necessarily good at verbalizing. They're not necessarily good at understanding emotions, navigating problems and crises. They're not as good at meeting their own needs. And so life for them is harder really for sure, higher rates of depression and anxiety. Also higher rates of OCD, which is a huge factor in suicide that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. So if anyone says that they're going to kill themselves, it's important to believe them until you gather enough information to find out if that is just words or if there's a plan. And that's where you want to get a third opinion or second opinion and find out are are they talking are they what they is what they really mean i'd rather be dead than alive right now because it's so hard the majority of those i've worked with who are neurodivergent who say they want to kill themselves or are going to kill themselves the majority of them are saying i don't know how to cope with life but they don't actually have a plan. And if I pry and ask about what they would do or how they would kill themselves, they typically will share something that they've seen on a movie or that they've imagined, but very fleetingly. And, and maybe they'll share something that's unrealistic for how they would kill themselves. Um, Generally speaking, the whole process is more immature for them than a neurotypical struggling with suicide. So if a 22-year-old 20, is saying they're suicidal, it, it feels to me like a teenager who's 14, and I've dealt with them in counseling, a 14-year-old dealing with suicide and what that looks like. Not that they couldn't kill themselves, they could. So we have to be careful and take it serious. At the same time, more often than not, when someone talks about killing themselves, it's a cry for help of, I don't know how to live. I need something to be different. I am stuck. Um, I really would like some help to figure out my life. So the other thing that I've seen is that most of the teens and young adults that I've worked with who are suicidal are less likely to kill themselves because to actually go through a suicide requires quite a bit of proactivity and thought and even research. And they don't really like hard things. They don't like scary things. They avoid things they don't know. So the thought of shooting themselves with a gun is like completely out of the question for all of those I've worked with. The, the less intense, scary, gory things like taking a bottle of pills is much more likely because it doesn't require something new and scary 
like jumping off a bridge or having a car set up with carbon monoxide poisoning. They're just, those are just ways that they don't think about. So I, I think pills would be the most scary for me to watch because it's something that they've likely done over and over. And for them to take a whole bunch of pills would not be out of their comfort zone. Um, also with neurodivergence, I found that they're not very good at actually killing themselves, meaning they'll they'll take 20 ibuprofen and think they're going to die, and, and then they wake up and they didn't. Um, and then others, I, I really believe that they were playing around with something. Um, one one student who attempted suicide, and not, not of mine, but he was at college, he was playing around with cutting himself to see what it would be like to to cut his wrists and he ended up cutting way too hard and way too deep and then he panicked and he called 911 and it totally looked like a suicide and he said well i was thinking about it but i was just seeing if it would hurt to see if i could ever go with go through with it i didn't actually want to kill myself but he almost died because of it so you know there's i'm not sure what else to say about that I want to go into causes and factors for autists. They have more difficult life events. They're more likely to be alone and lonely, um, hopeless, despair. Another thing is many of them have learned to be masking their emotions and what they feel because they've been taught that their impulsive actions aren't healthy socially and they're not reading the room so just put on a mask uh, don't talk don't share they've learned that if they have strong feelings that they're usually not in line with the situation so don't share it and don't talk about it so a lot of people might not recognize when they are severely depressed or that they are in a crisis maybe they're generally depressed because their life is hard that maybe they wouldn't notice when someone does a really big crash. Um, I think it's important to separate self-harm from suicide. Cutting is a very common mental health disorder, obsessive compulsive or addictive behavior. Taking a sharp object and scraping, scratching, cutting, or even burning with flames has become a way of self-harm, self-loathing, anxiety coping. It's addictive, it's intense, and it can take somebody from a manic place where their brain is just not shutting off, and it can bring them right back down to reality where they can focus on something sharp and intense or burning and intense. And it kind of works like uh, the the transcranial magnetic therapy where it resets the brain a little bit and calms someone down. And as horrible as it is to mutilate our bodies, there is something about cutting that works. It doesn't work effectively because once you're done, you have to deal with the fact that you have cuts in your arms and the intensity of the cutting is what makes it effective temporarily. And as you get more and more used to the pain and the the intensity shock that you're actually cutting on yourself, the more comfortable you get and the deeper you have to cut and the more often you have to cut. So it's a, it's a horrible intervention, but that's why it actually becomes a habit and a pattern. And that is not suicide. So take them, take them very differently. And at the same time, I've had a lot of people who nearly killed themselves from cutting, even though the intention was not suicide because they cut too deep and too hard. Um, I think it's important to recognize that they are not suicidal because they're autistic. They're suicidal because their needs aren't met. They're suicidal because they're lonely. They're suicidal because they're hopeless and they have despair. They're suicidal because they don't see a path forward. Those are all the same reasons that anyone else is suicidal. It's just with autism, life is harder in general. And I, I love to explain to people that we are way more similar than dissimilar that 98% of our human traits with typicals versus atypicals are the same, and that we always focus on the, the two to 3% that's different. 
So when someone is saying that they want to die, it is important to listen. They're saying, I'm miserable. My life sucks. Let's get my needs met. Let's make a plan. I need to connect. I need attachment. And they're not good at any of those things, or at least usually they're not. And so they need extra time, extra help, extra intervention, extra love. And oftentimes the people around them that have been boosting them up and supporting them their whole life, they're exhausted. And they've often sacrificed many things in their own life to be there for a person with a disability. And I think I think the thing that killed me off, and, and probably my wife as well, the most as parents, was trying to maximize success and killing ourselves, thinking that we might be able to mitigate and get rid of all of our loved ones who are neurodivergent, all of their pain and, and help them be and feel more typical. And I think we didn't know where the line was between what was totally unrealistic and what was realistic and our expectations had to change from a mentality of, well, why don't we just keep fighting tooth and nail um, no matter what, no matter how much uh, blood, sweat, and tears we have to give to, to give them everything that they can. And it had to change to that's killing us and we're killing ourselves and we're moving our loved one a couple of degrees at the most. So that wasn't effective and sustainable. And as lifelong mentors, we have to know how to play the long game and run a marathon. Uh, that doesn't mean that their support will stay the same the rest of their lives. If if they're level three autistic or nonverbal autistic, then yes, that's that's a pretty lifelong level of support needed. Uh, but for those who are level two or level one autistic or severely ADHD, nonverbal learning disorder, they they can continue to develop and gain skills the rest of their life. So mentoring can change. I want to talk about OCD for a minute. Almost every case of suicide that was ongoing and not because of a single traumatic event that was any any case that was mental health where they became fixated on suicide had a component of obsessive compulsive thinking. And that's why once a suicidal episode passes, the person or the client says, I, I'm glad I didn't kill myself. But at the time, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And so I think that's where a medication really can come in. And that's why medications can be helpful as it does lift their mood, but it can also um, keep their OCD symptoms in check if they start obsessing about suicide. Now on the on that note, I want to talk about the difference between suicide and OCD. There was a client I had who really believed they were going to kill themselves and they came in for suicide and their goal was to not kill themselves. And so I thought it was a classic suicide depressed client. They didn't seem depressed at all. And after talking with them for a while, they they explained that they they keep thinking about jumping out of their moving car into oncoming traffic that is passing the other direction. And I I, I finally said, Do you do you want to kill yourself? And he said, No, no, I don't want to kill myself at all. I just can't stop thinking about it. And so now we're into obsessive compulsive disorder, not not suicide and depression. Totally different mental health case, but he assumed he was suicidal because he kept thinking about killing himself. Um, someone else had the same issue or situation with jumping off high places. The more the more they they imagine jumping off a high place, the more it's stuck in their brain, and they couldn't stop thinking about it. They didn't want to kill themselves; they just couldn't stop thinking about it. And in and in a sense, there's kind of a purging where it becomes so overwhelming that you want to purge the thought by acting on it. And then they could actually kill themselves because they can't stop thinking about it, but it wouldn't be because they were suicidal, even though the definition on on the death certificate would say suicide, it would be OCD, not depression. Um, so those are different. At the same time, those who continually go back to suicide as as the option, especially those who are neurodivergent, I think there's always been a, an obsessive compulsive thought process where it's the go-to and they start being black and white and rigid about 
thoughts of it's the only option I have. I'm going to have to do it. In the end, I'm going to kill myself anyway. And it starts to be uh, almost unavoidable where they they have decided this is the only option. And once they do that, they can't get it out of their head. And every time life gets hard, immediately the neural pathways in their brain go to suicide, kill yourself. Um, and that's a very dangerous cycle because eventually anyone with with that type of obsessive thinking and go to gets exhausted battling it and most of them do battle it they're like no no i don't really want to kill myself why do i keep thinking that why do i keep going there and eventually they get tired of fighting it and it almost feels like it's useless to fight it and so suicide happens or suicide attempts happen so in those cases make sure that you're addressing the ocd not just depression and it is important to give them other options and point out that it isn't the only option and that life will get better but they actually need reasons life will get better um, our students need concrete things to help them think they, they need evidences that life's worth living you can't just talk to them and say it's going to get better you can't just say well you'll be happier next year or eventually you'll get a girlfriend or boyfriend they actually need something tangible and i think we all do need something tangible but especially for for neurodevelopmental brains they need something concrete right in front of them that says i know things will be different because i'm seeing it and there's proof and there's evidence so that would be really helpful i don't think it's fair for us as loved ones to be put through a situation where we are the only person who is keeping them from killing themselves that is exhausting and it's dangerous it's really important to bring on a team whether they're paid professionals or extended family members or friends it's just important that you aren't alone because one nobody can keep that up 24 7 and two if they ever did kill themselves I think it would be really hard to deal with the fact that we were the only ones there. So it was totally on our shoulders that they died, which isn't fair or true. So get a team, get people around you, get lots of other opinions, share your burden. Um, talk to a counselor for you is really helpful, actually. So I want to talk about extreme cases where suicide, talk of suicide, obsession about suicide has gone on for months and years and it has become a pattern of coping to either say they're suicidal to get help or to attempt suicide to get help and this is just as dangerous of a suicidal situation as any other but the pattern is there and Oftentimes it looks like somebody saying they're suicidal because they don't know what else to do. And when they say they're suicidal, everyone drops what they're doing and rallies around them. And it becomes a way to get the help that they need, even if it's very immature and manipulative. And even if they don't really want to die, if that becomes a pattern, you have to address it with the possibility that they could kill themselves, but also understand that they're really just immaturely asking for help and the problem with that is eventually they could say well i better follow through on it but the more common problem that happens right away is the loved ones of those who are claiming suicide become frazzled and worn out and burned out and you can't stay in that situation very long if there's a client or excuse me a loved one who constantly says I need to go to the hospital because I'm suicidal a lot of times they just want an escape from their world and a reset maybe they're actually scared they're going to kill themselves but it could be either right it, it doesn't always mean they're about to kill themselves it could be a coping mechanism that's not actually suicide someone else who says that they're suicidal long enough and nobody believes them they they might start adding on to it some action to have people take it serious and 
it's a way to get people to to help them. And if they're asking for help, or maybe they're just asking for attention, and and this this area gets really hard because there are a small percentage of those who are actively saying they're suicidal and maybe even playing around with actions of suicide, where it it is about seeking love and attention and coping. And it can be addictive to get everyone to jump at the sign or sound of someone killing themselves. And that can be pretty habit forming. And that's really hard to work through because you don't want to say you're just manipulating. They really are asking for help, but I don't know how suicidal they are, but they could be. So that's a scary, dangerous situation. In an extreme and long-term scenario where suicide becomes the norm and maybe even attempts at suicide, you know, halfway attempts where I, I took more pills this time, more than last time, but probably not enough. And I slept for, for 12 hours and I didn't tell anybody. And I, you know, and I tell people a few days later that, Hey, I, I slept and took a bunch of pills. And those are, those are serious because they could accidentally kill themselves. Even if they weren't really trying to, they were like rubbing up against it to try it out, try it on for size. They were practicing and that's dangerous and scary. When somebody has been in the hospital, they've been in every treatment, they've been on every medication, and they've seen dozens of counselors, and they're still obsessive compulsively focused on suicide as the way out. It almost becomes a part of their personality and their identity. That is an exhausting place. It's not very common that that occurs, but it does occur. I had one dad who got a call from his 20-something year old son and like dozens of times before, he said, Dad, I'm suicidal. I think I'm going to kill myself. I don't know what to do. And this is this is after the family had been through six, seven years of treatment, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of every possible intervention and therapy and medication and doctor. And the dad finally just said, well, I, I don't know. I don't know what I can do. You know, you're 12 hours away by car. I, I'm at work. I'm going to lose my job again. And if I leave, so I, I don't know what you want me to do, buddy, but I, I guess I just want to know, what do you want me to, to say at your funeral? Because I, I can't fight anymore. What do you want me to, to have your funeral look like? Maybe you should just tell us. And the son got really quiet. And he said, I don't want to talk anymore. And he hung up the phone. And the dad had to live for the next couple of hours wondering if the son was just going to kill himself or not. And it was a crappy couple of hours, but he'd been in that place for a hundred times before. So he pushed through knowing that that could be the last time he saw his son. But he didn't believe it deep down. Deep down, he just knew that the pattern had to change. And later that night, the dad reached out to his son by text and said, hey, man, how are you feeling? And the son called him and said, you know, I'm kind of sick of I'm kind of sick of this pattern. I'm done with the suicide stuff. I, I don't I'm not going to let myself go there anymore. I'm, I'm going to break the pattern. And he did. And that's what he needed at that point after gaining a ton of skills, after being on the right meds. He just at the end needed to break the habit. But I don't think that he was actually suicidal anymore. So there's there's this whole spectrum of murky suicidal stuff that only you can go through as, as a process, as a spectrum. And that's why the programs out there that just say be aware, take people serious and get them help. It's like the very beginning of the of the journey that you're going to go through and that many of you have probably been through or in now. I don't know how your journey will end. I certainly hope it doesn't end with suicide. I also know that you can't keep someone alive who wants to kill themselves. The good news is most people don't want to kill themselves consistently. It comes and goes and it comes in waves and life does change and things do get better. I don't know if, if that's helpful or harmful today to talk about it, but I, 
I don't like parents having a big unknown in front of them and have absolutely no idea what they're going through thinking that everything is black and white and that suicide is just suicide and they all fit the same box because they don't. I think they're all very different and individual. I think neurodiversity plays a big part in it to get them into the suicide, especially with the heightened OCD in neurodivergent brains. Um, so if you find yourself wondering and not understanding what to do or how to deal with it, yeah, absolutely get help for the person struggling, but also for you and get a feel for what is this? What are they wanting? What are they actually needing? What are they capable of? What do they have access to? Every one of those questions is completely unique and individual to the situation and the person. So I hope it never happens to you. And if it does, for you, it's not the end of the world. And it's not likely. By far, more often than not, someone who is having suicidal thoughts doesn't end up killing themselves and they don't end up dying because there is help and things do work to get them out of those ruts. So good luck to you. I'm happy to respond to any emails. If anyone has any questions, maybe I can point you in the right direction, but it's just a really hard situation and I'm sorry if you're having to go through it. Thanks for joining me and good luck to you. And I, I really, I love this population and I love the families who support them. And so today we dove into the nitty gritty. Have a great day and have a great week and I hope things are good for you. Thanks. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Autism and Neurodiversity with Jason and Debbie. If you want to learn more about our work, come visit us at jasondebbie.com. That's J-A-S-O-N-D-E-B-B-I-E.com.